Hi everyone, today I spoke to Christiane Kerr. Christiane is a mindfulness teacher and a yoga teacher and she teaches both children and adults. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you do, please hit subscribe and thanks for watching. Could you explain what mindfulness is perhaps as opposed to meditation more generally and also what you take yoga to be? I mean, it's quite difficult to give a succinct definition, but I would say um, mindfulness, you mean mindfulness versus meditation. I think mindfulness, um, they both go hand in hand, but I think mindfulness is more about um, the noticing that goes on when you're practicing and the meditation is more about the focus element. So you have an object of meditation and you're, you're aware that that keeps your focus and you bring it back to that. The mindfulness is noticing when your mind's wandered off and bringing it back. It's that ability to notice that rather than being completely lost in thought. And yoga, like how would you explain what, what yoga is? Um, yoga is a little bit more difficult because I think it means so many things to, to so many people. I think as well, it's obviously we've got yoga in the West, it's from a, um, an Eastern tradition and it comes from a, a sort of really many thousands of years background, but it's, um, it, it's a practice. When, when I'm talking to children, I'll say yoga was um, created many years ago by all these old wise men and wise old wise men and women who were walking around in nature and saw how everything in nature didn't sort of decay in the same way that we do as humans. So they created this series of, of postures and based around animals and nature and it helped our health and our well-being and our bodies to, to age well. So that that's a kind of version of what I might say to children to make it kind of simple. Um, I think for adults, every adult get different things. Some people do it for fitness. Personally, I think there's um, a, a spiritual element and there's obviously eight limbs of yoga. I think that's probably the best, the best bit. Eight limbs of yoga are um, you don't actually start um, the physical practice before you've done the first two limbs, which are the yamas and the niyamas, which are kind of ethics and ways of living. And when did you first encounter either mindfulness or yoga? Do you remember the first time you did either of them? I think I was introduced, I, I spent a lot of time in nature as a child and I think you get a glimpse then of, I mean I think children are more naturally mindful and in the moment, but I think nature is a really good way to connect with the present moment and and I was lucky enough to be brought up in, in, um, in countryside and um, so that was a, a glimpse of, of that kind of peace, stillness, being part of something bigger. But I probably didn't recognise that till I knew more that there was a word called mindfulness and this was, was a thing. And I think that's helpful when you're trying to teach to children because they are more intrinsically, naturally mindful. So it's, it's letting them acknowledge that this, this is something that they might lose. But if they acknowledge it and they build on it as a skill, it can be helpful. Um, and with uh, yoga, well, and also I did a bit of Tai Chi. I, I worked in Hong Kong in my early 20s and I'd see all these um, people out practicing in the morning, usually in the early morning, and they would just be so serene and peaceful looking and, and really focused on what they were doing. So I took classes there and I remember thinking, oh, there's, there's something in this, something a bit more than just the movement. There was something that, that gave me a glimpse again. Um, and then yoga, I got into yoga when I was um, pregnant with my second child and I went to antenatal classes and I was having a, a bit of a problem at the time, I'd gone through quite a lot of difficult stuff and there was something about that yoga which was very much a, a grounded, it was a Scaravelli inspired yoga with a, a woman called Lolly Sturck who's still teaching um, um, prenatal yoga and she um, it was just phenomenal. It just, I'd come out feeling, oh, everything's okay. You know, there was something very profound about the impact that that had. So that was me kind of hooked, if you like, and, and, and on, a, on a path. Before you became a, like a mindfulness and yoga teacher and teacher trainer, you actually worked in the television industry for a, a while, is that right? I did, yes. I, um, I originally worked in broadcast PR and then that was when I was in Hong Kong. And then when I came back, to the UK, I um, worked in various 
I had various jobs in television. I, I got more involved in the production side here, so I was um, vision mixing, which is kind of live editing. And I also did studio directing and some producing. And it was really, it was good fun at the time. Um, so I enjoyed that a lot. It was very varied and, and it was a good job for my children to go freelance. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you work for like, like uh, any specific company for a while or did you move around? Or? Well, I freelance. So I worked for a lot of companies. I worked for BBC ITV, but I worked, I did the first um, live broadcast for uh, Sky Sky Sports, wow. um, so that was quite exciting. And, and the, you know, I was vision mixing that one, and the light was on, so I couldn't see what was going on in my gallery. So it's quite, it was very different to, to yoga. It was quite kind of high adrenaline, and one mistake, and everyone would know. And um, so it was, it was one of the first ones, and there was all these, it was a big party, and there was all these celebs walking down. You're like, ah, what do I make a mistake? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. You were giving me some tips of, of setting up before we started this, now I understand where you, where you got the knowledge from. Um, but what, so what was the catalyst um, in terms of you switching your career, quite, quite massively I guess, to, to yoga and mindfulness full time? I mean it was, it was a, a slow transition, it didn't happen overnight. I think, um, you know, I had, I did the, the vision mixing and the TV work, other bits of TV work, I did probably until about 2000 and six, 2007, but I'd started Calm for Kids in 1998. And really, I think my life then was based around my children and fitting in with them. When I was at Sky, I did mostly sports and um, and it was generally tended to be evenings and weekends and that fitted in very well when the children were young. And then when they went to school, I had to sort of work around that. So um, I, I actually started teaching. I, I trained as a, a Montessori teacher to teach up to ages from three and a half to nine and um, I did. I trained in that and worked part-time in that for two years but I was also still doing a bit of, of um, vision making to make, make ends meet. So it was, it was quite, it was a lot but I think I was really kind of passionate about, I love working with children and I've always loved being around children um, and I love uh, this growing sort of passion, if you like, for, for yoga and mindfulness was developing. So I started teaching kids way back then when I was working in the schools. And I think there's a, there's a real um, alignment with Montessori teaching and yoga and mindfulness because there's the multi-sensory elements and, and it's about the spiritual preparation of the teacher. So you, you're not, you're kind of getting out of the way and allowing it to be child-centred. Child did you say Montessori teaching? What was Montessori that? teaching. What, was it, what is that exactly? Well, it's a kind of method that was um, devised by Maria Montessori, um, who was Italian, and um, it, it is a, a child centre approach, and it's about um, the prepared environment. Um, so in, in the environment, you have shelves with, you know, practical life shelves, and, and children will maybe go and they'll spend the time um, polishing shoes. And, and what you do as the teachers, you allow them to do that as often as they, they want. And some days you'll have a child who will be sitting, polishing shoes for, you know, 20 minutes. This is a, a preschool child. And then you'll have um, sort of elements of the classroom that are focused more on numeracy and literacy. And the literacy would be um, sand letters. So they'd be learning from a sensory element. Um, and then there would be... Um, blocks, so they'd be using their bodies to learn with about ma maths and counting beats. So it was quite um, a tangible. It was it was about making things quite concrete, um, introducing concepts in quite a, a sort of concrete way. How did you learn to firstly teach mindfulness and yoga to, to people, and then also learn to teach um, as you um, train other teachers to do that? Like, what's the process in, in learning all this? Um, well, I think back then it was really meditation rather than mindfulness. Um, so, and a lot of people were very wary of it because I think we didn't have the, the science around it that we do now. And I think um, I realised when I was starting to, to teach children, and my children were young then, so I had a lot of people who were willing, and um, I realised I'd have to get some kind of qualification. And there wasn't a, a meditation qualification and um, we're not one that was recognised. I, I did train, I, I did sort of Buddhist courses, I did the Vipassana course. Um, but I, I think when you work with children as well, I did tend to keep it 
sort of secular and, and about grounding and about being the body. But I did um, a yoga training with Shivananda Yoga, which was ashram based, but it was in the UK. Normally you go to India, but they did one in Dorset. And I think that was in 2003. So I had some professional qualification then. Um, so that was the first step. And then um, I started teaching a lot then. So I learned a lot through experience, both children and adults. And I approached schools and I did two training courses for children in the States. I think anybody that's on a yoga and mindfulness um, kind of career path, if you like, knows that there's going to be a lot of training because you, you really want to, to be constantly sort of growing and developing and learning because um, it's such a, a vast, you're never going to know it all. So it's, it's um, yeah, so that was how I kind of transitioned. And then I did my mindfulness, um, I think in 2000 and seven or 2008 I became familiar with the work of John Kabat-Zinn and in 2009 I did a, an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course and then in 2010, 2010, 2011 I trained to teach te uh, teenagers, that was the first course um, in the UK, uh, mindfulness to teenagers and then I, I trained in the States to teach mindfulness to all ages and I did some um, other training courses in the States for yoga for children because they were a little bit ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So how long does that typically take to go all the way from starting out to starting out to you know being qualified and be able to teach and be able to train other people? Well I think the training other people um, I worked uh, I, my second yoga training was with the London Yoga Teacher Training Group and they had um, a sort of once you've graduated and you taught for a while you could trained to be an assistant teacher with them. And it's a small organisation. So I did that for a while, um, but I was more intent on, so I got some, some teacher training experience. I think you need to have five years of experience at least, because that's coming from your experience. Um, and there's not a, a path. I think now there's more paths in terms of, you've got this many hours, that many hours. But I would say by the time I started training, I had over, a thousand hours of, of teaching practice behind me and, and a lot of hours of, of training behind me. Um, I think it's probably more formal now. Um, you said that when you teach children you strip out some of the spiritual kind of elements of, of, of meditation and make it more secular, is that right? I didn't say yeah. I strip out okay. the, the more no. spiritual elements but I think you, your, your language and your approach to teaching is, is, is very kind of grounded in the body and the breath and it is it's it's secular in its nature and that it's not um drawing on the spiritual aspects but i think any practice is can can you can deeply connect with a practice and i think that that's the spiritual element but i don't actually teach that i think that's something that everyone finds on their own i think you're just it's the same as the Montessori classroom, you're sort of showing what's available. And I think you've got to be very careful because you're going in, what, I, what my experience has been as a peripatetic teacher. Um, so I think you've got to be careful that you, you're respecting that open and um, delicate nature of young people. So, um, you know, I think it's really important that you, you kind of keep it quite grounded. Do you think that spiritual elements or, or some other things are sometimes left out of mindfulness these days. There's sometimes some criticism that certain aspects have been removed to kind of make it fit in more of you know, society and people like you to take courses and stuff. Is there any truth to that? And Definitely, um, you know, I think there's that article on muck mindfulness, you know, corporations yeah. using it to just get more out of their, their people. And, and I think that's true. I think our culture's changed so much that there's so many elements of mindfulness that can benefit benefit so many people, and I think the fact that it's self secular means that you don't have to be involved in any religion to access it, and I think that's that's a good thing. Um, I think you you maybe are accessing it on a different level. I think it's it's important as a teacher to have a a deeper grounding in it in its roots, but I think that's not for everyone. Um, so I think, you know, and, and kind of, I think it's a, it's a, it, it's about your, 
nervous system there is a lot of practical things we know now in ways that it can help and and I think um, you know I've heard teachers sort of well-known teachers that have been teaching for a long time talk about you know in a few years time we'll see a mindfulness practice in the same way that we saw exercise in the in the 80s you know we suddenly got into this huge exercise craze because we knew it was good for us and I think there's something about that in mindfulness and if you're getting more people involved because it's secular that's not a bad thing I think there's room for for everybody to, to pick and choose their level mm-hmm. I've seen uh, you know, do you know Sam Harris yes yeah yes. I've seen Sam say that you know kind of following on from the point you've just made that mindfulness can also you know be helpful and maybe even more valuable and that it allows you to kind of understand the nature of your mind and not necessarily in a way that it just able enables you to kind of upgrade it so that you can be less stressed or something what can mindfulness teach you about your yourself that um, isn't necessarily then like practically usable in some way well i think even with very young children you can see that i think with um with children you can teach them um you know you can give them mindfulness practices simple techniques and and breath awareness practices there and mindful movement practices and i think um you can also relate that into their behavior particularly with kids they're very fascinated by the brain so you can teach them you know about the brain and how you know we get angry and what's happening in our brain when we get angry and i think that is a, a sort of self-awareness so it gives children that little moment and and dan daniel siegel talks about this that even i think it's the whole brain child a book he's got that even as young as four and five you know by teaching the two things hand in hand the kind of understanding of the brain with the mindfulness practice you can begin to develop that that pause in mindfulness which is so important and i think with adults because we're sitting with ourselves for quite a long time and and you know even when we're sitting and, and sometimes you're like oh my mind's miles away I can't focus today I, this isn't I wanted a good practice today because I've got the, you know you, you can see your mind racing and I think that in itself is helpful it's like oh well I'm sitting here practicing and I'm now worrying about my brain and you can notice your patterns of, of judgment and how you talk to yourself your inner voice and I think that's really enlightening and really helpful in terms of how we can change and make more helpful choices certainly in my experience that's been a quite a, a profound benefit of mindfulness for me do you think either mindfulness or yoga has had more of a positive impact in your life or are they just different in, in certain ways I think they're very different and they're very the same I think um, you know yoga basically all those yoga postures were, were done so that people could sit in meditation for a long time so it, it was designed really for um, if you like the kind of dual is meditation or the benefits come from meditation I wouldn't say that's true in, in my instance I think you can um, access so much information through the body um, but I think um, yeah no, I, I think there's no one that's better than the other I think they go hand in hand and I think there's times definitely in my practice when I've you know I had a, a sort of major bereavement and I actually couldn't sit still I and so but I wanted I needed the practice and I knew the benefits of the practice so even I would put down a yoga mat and I would just be walking up and down the yoga mat and I did get that rest it was literally I was coming into my body I was focusing on my breath but I found it very difficult in those moments to be still so having a simple yoga practice or movement practice was really helpful there mm-hmm. so I think that there is a, a real um coupling if you like of the two I think they, they, there's I mean mindfulness I think as we speak of it now is a lot of it comes from the mindfulness based stress reduction course which is a very specific course um, and obviously you've got a history of it in, in Vipassana traditions but um, it's it's all in the same um, bucket if you like in my view how do you fit both of these because you say they couple quite nicely together like into your week or into your kind of normal daily routine when do you do them and how often for um well it's interesting because we're we're coming out of winter or we're sort of in spring now but um i find it very hard to get up early in the morning and i know that's the best time for me to do it so um in the winter i will usually 
fitter practice if I can around my day. I'm working more from home now. Um, so, because my, my courses have gone online, so it's much more computer based. And um, I'll fit in a practice about 11, 11.30. And I'll make sure I do at least a half hour in the morning at some point. In Now, like this morning, I got up and I did um, half an hour. And then I'll try and put in a longer practice later on. And that practice, at the moment, this morning I did um, 15 minutes of movement and then 15 minutes of um, sitting sitting practice. And my focus this morning was on my breath. If you if you stick you know kind of well to like a regular practice for for either of them for mindfulness or yoga like what are kind of kind of some milestones you think you can you can get to where you feel like you've you've kind of jumped up a level like if you do it for six months or you do it for a year or you do it for ten years so there's certain points you think well after this long you probably you feel <laughs> a slightly different way I know it's going to vary massively on the person and and maybe it's unhelpful if you even think like this but. Uh, no, I think it's really interesting. I was thinking, kind of, yeah. I remember when I started teaching yoga, like there was, um, you were competing with kids' football classes or oh. kids' gymnastics. And I think everyone wanted a, a certificate when you got to level one or level two. But I, I, I do think there's something really important about holding on to that beginner's mind. I mean, I, I feel I've changed dramatically from when I started to now, but then that could be life's journey and all the experiences I've had as much as the practice I think the practice definitely for me has deepened and developed I know some people who've have practiced for maybe 15 years and then given it up and they and they still feel some benefits from it but they uh, it, it's not in their life so much so I I I don't I'm not person I don't I couldn't really comment on that I think it's milestones um and I think that the the striving element, you know, it's it's one of the attitudes that we talk about is, is non-striving. So I think it's it's quite nice to, to allow your practice to be as it is rather than worrying too much about um, am I progressing or... Um, I think as long as you're doing it, I always feel as a teacher, I, I never feel like a bad teacher unless I've, I've had a practice gap. I think as a teacher, I think it's just really important that you have a practice. Yeah, I think so. people can just sometimes find it a little bit hard to, to not think of, you know, where, they're, where they are and where they're going. Because, you know, when you sign up for something, you often see these, you know, list of benefits, I guess, that you're going to hopefully get, you know, going to help you with stress or whatever. But at the same time, you're told not to, not to think about where you are in terms of that. But it can be a little bit difficult to kind of you know forget that you're not supposed to focus on it too much when that's kind of the reason you're doing it um, it's really yeah. interesting and and i think people you know if they don't get the benefits will will give up i mean i remember the first um, mbsr course i did um the teacher said um you know just see it as um i'm giving you a packet of, of seeds and you don't know what they are they're mixed seeds and you know if you go and sprinkle them in your garden and, and you don't know when they'll come up or or what will come up and it might take six months, it might take a year, it might come up tomorrow. And I felt that was a really helpful, it's like it's like having a, a, an element of, of trust. And I think that's the thing about it being, you know, now it's been very much, um, you know, it's been highly researched and there's a very academic approach to it. But I think that element of trust and trusting you, the, your instinct and that it's working for you is really important. So I wanted to ask you now, why are you so passionate about your work? Like, what do you enjoy about it? And what's, what's fulfilling about teaching people to, to meditate and do yoga and, and also to train others? In, in it? I think I realised quite early on if I wanted to do it, and because the training for, for all these things is quite expensive, you know, the yoga training and, you know, to train to be an MBSR teacher, you know, you have to pay quite a lot of money and it's a time commitment. So I realised that I'd have to do it on a professional level to kind of fuel my own sort of passion for it. Um, I think the variety of it and I think the way it's constantly changing, I think it's been fascinating um, over the past few years how, how things have changed with more um, Zoom um, and or online offerings. And, and that's interesting, particularly with yoga, that it, 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 I haven't enjoyed teaching yoga to adults in the same way, but I've really enjoyed the training because, you know, you're 
teaching to people that have a yoga practice, but how do they adapt that for children? So it, that's been really interesting because I've kind of reconnected with my old production skills in terms of TV and I've been filming kids and setting up photo shoots. So that's been a nice element to reconnect with. And I, I really enjoy working with children. I think they remind us of the how simple and joyful life can be and it doesn't you know they, they get upset and it's not that their lives are straightforward or easy but I think they just remind you and they teach you so much so I think that that is a, a huge uh, thing and I you know I'm I think the, the children and it's probably the main thing but combining the both is a, is a real joy and I think it's very creative as well it really gives you the opportunity well how can I engage children with this you know, you can't just say sit there and breathe for five minutes. You've got to try and um, show them ways that they can access it that adults perhaps would just sit and they try and they trust. Whereas with children, you've got to um, sort of engage them in a different way. How do they react differently to, to mindfulness or yoga like children? Is it? I think one of the things, and this comes up a lot in the training courses, is managing your classes. Um, because with adults, you know, generally they've paid to come to class or they've chosen to come. And often with children, it's their parents. Sometimes you're doing it within the school. So you've got voluntary attendance, involuntary attendance. Um, so I think you've got managing behaviour. And I think as a teacher, that's something you've got to master quite early on um, in terms of, you know, you've got to be able to, to manage the class from a safety aspect, but also from making the, the, the environment such that you can actually teach these things. And I think that's a really interesting in point. So you've got to get that sort of sorted out. And it's different to how you would manage maybe a, a, a mainstream a math maths class or something. But I think you, you've got to be sort of modelling the behaviour. You've got to be practising what you preach. And I think the main thing for me with that is as long as it's not disrupting the learning of the group or there's a safety aspect involved, I think you, you, you've got a little bit more flexibility in how you do that. Um, and I think you're dealing with a lot of developmental issues. Um, there's a huge increase in ADHD now, attention children are finding it harder to sit still so I think there's a lot of the movement element comes in the mindful movement element comes in there so um, yeah, I think it's just got to be a little bit more adaptable and um, responsive to, to what's happening each and every day I and mean, you might have your class plan but I think you've got to go with the flow and you're the director of Calm for Kids, which is a, an organisation. Can you say a bit about what you do there and, and actually how you ended up? Like, did you set that up yourself? I did uh, set yeah. that up. I mean, yeah. it's an organisation. It's a very small yeah. organisation. So and it's it's kind of gone through various... Um, there's been more people involved and less people involved at various times. Um, it, that started when I, when I started doing... Um, some audio when I think it was my daughter was three and she w wouldn't go to sleep and she was quite sort of anxious at night and she wasn't anxious in other ways and so I started doing these visualizations for her and um, I, I found a, a publisher a man called Glenn Harold who does a lot of he was a hypnotherapist then but he does a lot of meditation and relaxation now he was I think it was on um audio, not, not even CDs, you know, those old tapes. <laughs> he had complete relaxation. But he published it, and I used the name Calm for Kids then. Um, so that, that it started, that's how the name started. And then it just kind of grew. It was a sideline, as I said, until about 2007. And then I thought, right, I'll go full steam ahead. Now. And it's great, there's so many companies now offering mindfulness and yoga to children um, and, and there's a I think there's a, an old party parliamentary group which I'm part of I'm part of the education pillar for that for yoga to be in schools and there's also a mindfulness um, old party parliamentary group to make it much more wide stream in places like prison and the health service so it is wonderful that it's being embraced in that in that way where do you think um, like the kind of trends going in terms of prisons and, and workplace and schools and stuff? Do you think it's going to keep can kind of keep improving? Or uh, I think it is. I think there's other elements coming in now. You, you'll see. Um, I think it was in the it was a magazine that I read, and they have a summary of 
you know, what's hot this week. And I think this it was tech and it was meditation tech. So you can just, it becomes not so much about meditation, but more about managing breathing, managing your stress level, managing your heart rate. Um, so I think there's a bit of a, 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 a kind of... Um, I was going to say smorgasbord, but I actually hate that word. But there's such a, it's like a, you've got a wide variety of things to choose from. And I think anything that helps people to, to um, find a way in is, is good. And some people will take it much more deeply than others. You know, it's not for everyone. Um, so I think it's, it's just having a, a variety of ways that people can find it and then explore the path that they want to take it a bit further. You've also got some kind of mindfulness for children recordings out on, on Amazon and online and over like 200,000 copies have been kind of sold and downloaded. Like, why do you think they've resonated and done so well? Like, I think it was very early on and um, initially I started with guided visualisations and relaxations. And I mean, they did have the multi-sensory elements and I don't know, I think the, I think having a Scottish voice maybe was quite good in those days. Um, I don't I don't know why they sold so well. I mean, I think I do feel that because they came out of um, my, you know, it was for my daughter. I think there was a real kind of quite a loving intention behind them, if you like. And I, I think sometimes those come out in in recordings. Um, so I, I don't know, but it's it's I mean, it's great that I sometimes hear from people in Australia that it's, it's changed their child's bedtime routine so it's it's kind of cool and they're now I think on um, obviously it's, they're not selling CDs anymore so they are just as downloads but there's also um, a new platform I can't remember the called actually but it's a, a, you get cards and they've got authors on there as well but rather than your child being exposed to tech they you just put the card in and it reads the QR and um, so they're on that too so it's is there like a similar equivalent for adults that you think uh, would be suitable? I mean, do you do anything before bed, like in terms of listening to anything that helps you relax? I think, um, I mean, there's a lot, like, I, I don't know about you, but with the, the body scan of the MBSR course, I used to do that and I'd be out like a light. And then when you start to get more attuned to it, it doesn't work. Um, so one thing I do find personally quite good is, is the yoga nidra, which is, is more of a, a, a different relaxation um, and you kind of work on the, you know, the relaxing the physical body and then you work on the breathing body, sort of the pranayamic elements. So there's sort of five levels of that and I find that quite relaxing. I think it's finding the right voice for you that connects and um, yeah, no, so I find that yoga nidra is quite good now and and yeah. If, if I'm struggling to sleep. And that, that MBSR call you mentioned a couple of times, it'd be good to ask you a bit about that for, for anyone who's not heard of it, because this is kind of the typical course that people take if they want to get into mindfulness. There's, as I said, it's, not, it's still not regulated in the UK, but there's um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There's places that you can train and there's a mindfulness, like, mindfulness network that has guidelines for teachers. And... Um, that's the kind of way that it goes and it's been quite thoroughly researched which is why it, it, it's seen as the kind of gold standard if you like and that that's the course that was created by John Kabat-Zinn and it's um, mindfulness-based stress reduction known as MBSR or there's also the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy which um, MBCT. I tend to do more MBSR because I don't have a therapeutic background um, and I think that's got a very specific structure and where I find it really helpful, I found it a bit dry when I first took it and, and you know, the guy said, I'll oh, keep going, the seeds will come up. And they did, actually. For me, it was about six months after the course. I was like, ah, and I do think that course, it keeps unfolding and, you know, you keep a teaching that seems very simple. You'll suddenly see a whole other helpful level to it. Uh and, you know, it combines elements of psychology and of neuroscience. So I think it's it's a really solid course. And where it's been brilliantly helpful for me is before, if I had done a meditation, I mean, I've, I've been practicing now since, I suppose, 1996. Um, but I think with MBSR, which I started in 2009, I've got that to come back to. It, it's really easy to get back on track 
it's it's got a real kind of structure it's very simple there's so many practices to choose from so for me that was a, a sort of game changer from that perspective like you said there's another slightly different course at mbct that's the kind of maybe the other most researched course and the kind of standardized course so how does that differ what's, what's the slight difference there the only difference really is in in um one of the lessons, I think it's lesson six, um, you, you do more about thoughts. MBCT is used for more for um, people who are, who are struggling with depression. MBSR can be helpful with that, but I think MBCT is recommended for that because they, they have a certain um, lesson in it that's much more about, you know, dealing with rumination and sort of recurrent thoughts. And uh, so that, that, in my understanding, that's the, ma- the main difference. But they're both fantastic courses. So is there any difficulties about being a mindfulness or yoga teacher? I mean, what, what can be challenging or, or maybe like emotionally difficult? Obviously, sometimes you're interacting with people who have to share their story and stuff like that. Is there anything that's difficult or about you know, either of these? Um, I think over the years, it's quite important to be supportive and to be accepting and, you know, everyone that's there, that they're coming to you and they might be quite vulnerable. So I think it's, being clear about your responsibility and your, your boundaries. And I think that's really important to set that up first. And I think it's the same as working with children, you know, they know your expectations of them. But I think sometimes, um, you know, people are vulnerable and, and sometimes I think when they're going into themselves a bit, those vulnerabilities can be exacerbated. And, you know, I think you've just got to deal with that very sensitively and, um that that can sometimes be quite kind of upsetting or challenging. Um, so, but I think that's part of the job and I think that's where the practice is, is really helpful. But I think the practice aligned with, you know, a, a good pre-course structure, you know, I think you've got to be very well organised in terms of making sure people know what it is you're teaching, what it is they're going to get. Is there like an expert, do you ever kind of have, feel like there's an expectation as a, as a mindfulness yoga teacher yourself to turn be very relaxed around people or especially people that you're teaching is that ever any pressure there or is that something you're not really thinking um, I, about? I think when you're teaching you've got to really model the behavior I think that I mean that's where the practice comes in but you know I think I get quite excited about things and uh, you know in my life and yeah and I think I think and I like a cup of coffee I like a glass of wine you know I think I don't think you need to be like this sort of Puritan and, um, you know, I think as long as you're kind of um, walking the talk and I think that's really absolutely key. Um, I think that's the main thing to make that makes you an authentic teacher, which I, I like to think of myself as an authentic teacher. So do, do teachers seem to come from all kind of walks of life or is there is, is there a typical kind of person that's drawn to being either a mindfulness or yoga teacher or I think it's you've got a really people from a, a, a many walks of life and I think um, a lot of people I've seen a lot of people who have maybe come into mindfulness teaching as a as a retirement career and I think that's 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 got its place too and I think there's a lot of life wisdom coming in um I think with yoga there's many more choices of good quality yoga teacher trainings um so I think costs may be an element in in who attracts what kind of courses mindfulness the MBSR is is quite an expensive course to do so that's um can make it difficult for people I think there's there's many more opportunities now being offered to make it a bit more diverse and to open it up to people who um, can connect maybe with others make it make it have a, a broader resonance because I think it's quite important that that you have an understanding of life and experience of life to, to relate to people um, um, yeah. so you've taught a lot of people mindfulness I mean what have you learned over all these years of, about people from teaching them uh, like what is what's maybe the the number one thing that's maybe surprised you the most or has been most interesting to, to learn about people and their lives? Um, what I think is really interesting is that, that we're all made of the same stuff and I think it's... Um, there was that saying which is um, difficulty reveals the character of... A, it's probably it's an old quote of a man rather than of, of people. But I think... 
we've all got all those things in us and I think it's understanding that you know we all have elements of luck in our lives so to make assumptions or to judge people I think is is not helpful to ourselves or to them I think it's it's kind of the empathy that comes from that way of thinking I think is is a really nice place to live from um what about yourself what what do you think you've learned most about yourself from maybe your own practice or, or teaching others um I think I'm much kinder to myself actually I think I'm not nearly so harsh on myself I I think I I let things go a little bit more I think I've learned to be with things a lot more easily I think I, I I'm quite a sensitive person uh, um, or certainly I was as a child and I think it's really helped me um, to, to see that sensitivity is obviously quite often reactive so it's it's kind of not take that as as a given and just sort of be with it before um, acting on it. Do you think there are ever any people who are genuinely so relaxed or content that they wouldn't benefit much from mindfulness or do you think it's something that even the most you know actually relaxed people could uh, you know would be would benefit from doing I think there's there's if you've drawn to it I mean you might be really relaxed and content um, but there might be something that happens in your life that rattles you I do think some people are much more naturally mindful but, but I mean they, maybe the people that are naturally content they're, they're being in nature more they're more restful I think everyone's got a different way of of accessing them for me I think because I um, was quite sensitive I think it's been really helpful I think it's been really good for my nervous system um, but yeah, I, I think there's there's so much it's such a, a massive um, profound never-ending fountain if you like mindfulness and, and yoga and meditation that there's something there for everyone if, if they want to find it so yeah thinking of it as also like a preventative thing then I suppose it's just curative it's helpful not just thinking I'm stressed or I need to yeah you know help myself, exactly actually help you deal with challenges as they come up is is a uh, is going to be a helpful thing reason to do it as well definitely yeah. and I think that's what's so great about giving children just simple things like the breath as a useful tool you know I mean that that changes that has such an impact on your nervous system and I think that's phenomenal that you can and it supports and develops healthy nervous systems so I think you know a lot of kids have trauma but if you can give them things to, to cope with things as they go along then they're not having to sort of deal with it later on and, and I think you know trauma that the spiral that you get into with that and the way of reacting I think if you can prevent that and have some kind of intervention like a mindfulness-based intervention. Are you an advocate of anything else? Um, I mean, I'm sure there'd be a few things, but you, is there anything that stands out apart from mindfulness you think is particularly good for people's, for adults or children's, like mental well-being? Uh, for me, be exercise, definitely. Mm. And, and I don't mean yoga is an exercise, but it's not as cardio, but I mean, I, I think exercise and sort of being outside in, in nature, I think that's fantastic. I mean, like exercise that really kind of walking brisk walking running I mean I swim um and, that, and that's great because you could really get into the breathing but I swim quite hard and I swim in cold water um but I think all those things are really good and I think connecting with other people is really important um and and, and that can be a difficult thing for people because sometimes being isolated and lonely um can impact uh, people's ne- mental health so but you know I think just being outside amongst people even if you're not connecting and I just think even smiling at people I mean all, all that it can be helpful those little things what do you think about self-help books or kind of pop psychology books do you think it, you, have you have you read many that have been helpful would you recommend any are you skeptical of any of these or well I, I mean I think pop psychology is, is slightly kind of um patronizing because it's like oh it's, it's it's popular so therefore it's not relevant I mean I really like the Malcolm Gladwell books I think there's 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 quite a lot of wisdom. I know he, he, a lot of people think it's it's all a bit easy, but and I, I think definitely self help books have have got their place um, and are really helpful. I think if anything helps somebody, and it's it's well written and it's rooted in in either that person's real experience. Um, you know, I think some people jump on a bandwagon, but I I think you know many people have written self help books that have been really helpful. 
So what plans have you got for the next few years in the future with mindfulness and yoga and everything? Well, I'm really enjoying um, the online, uh, doing everything online. So I'm trying to get that a little more... um, the tech, obviously I'm not a tech native, but I think it's interesting now because you don't need coding skills. So I find that fascinating. Um, I've got an online business manager starting for three months, so I'm hoping to get all my systems sorted and get a bit more strategy orientated because I think I'm quite excited about all the the opportunities that that online, I'd like to do some more audio. Um, I've got lots of courses, more courses that I'd like to do. Um, so we'll see. I, I think I need to just get everything more streamlined so that I'd be able to do that. Well, good luck with everything. It was uh, great speaking to you and hopefully we can maybe speak again at one point. But uh, yeah, thanks for speaking. The best of luck with everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the Human Podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.